Years ago, in the third episode we ever made, we talked about why the bard in Dungeons & Dragons was terribly, terribly misnamed. Later that same year, we discussed the paladin and the difficulties that class had being the thing they were named after. Sometime later, we covered the rangers' problematic origins and inspirations. And just this last year, we touched upon the monk and the confusion of traditions that brought to the game. In each case, we pointed out the historical and literary origins of the classes and discussed how these informed the design of the class in question. At least, where it did inform the design of the class in question. Because sometimes... It just seems like the name of the class was randomly selected from Roger's Thesaurus. But at least the class names are more or less descriptive of what the class is or does. It's fairly clear. Fighters fight, wizards are wise, sorcerers source, and rogue is just a polite way of saying, you're a thief, Harry. That sort of thing. All very straightforward and clear. Hardly anyone gets confused about any of it, ever. But as we look over the list of classes your character can be in D&D, and goodness, aren't there a lot of them now? One in particular stands out to us as a completely useless description of what the class actually is. In fact, not only is it useless, it's downright wrong, even offensive. It's classist, in the other sense of the word, thank you, derogatory, demeaning, and meant to marginalize, dehumanize, and disenfranchise a disfavored segment of society. And not even the original source material for the class got it right. Of course, we're talking about the Barbarian. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Barbarian first appeared in July of 1982 in Dragon Magazine No. 63, introduced by Gary Gygax himself as a sort of open playtest for readers. It was one of the more popular options from a group of new classes being looked at and tested privately. Initially, it was a subclass of Fighter, which, along with the Ranger and Paladin, made up what Gary called the whole fighting genre at the time. The article which appeared in the From the Sorcerer's Scroll column of the magazine, makes several interesting points about barbarians, which will come up again in a few minutes. Barbarians, according to Gary, detest magic and those who use it, although not so much that they deny the usefulness of clerics and healing spells. They are skilled at survival skills, or at least those that involve climbing, running, and jumping. They can hide in natural surroundings, have a very specific kind of sixth sense that prevents people from attacking them from behind, they're awfully good at jumping out at people and stabbing them, and can spot illusions and detect magic should the need arise. Which is all well and good and certainly comes in handy in a pinch. But of course, every character class comes with its limitations, and Gary put in a few interesting ones. The aversion to magic means barbarians can't use any magical items and, in fact, prefer to destroy them if no one is keeping a close eye on them. That in itself wreaks havoc in a group of player characters that not only might contain wizards and other spellcasters, but also fighters in need of a plus one sword or paladins in their fancy enchanted armors. Barbarians can neither read nor write and barely speak any language beyond their native tribal language and the universal language of common. They have to spend time and effort to be taught new languages, where other classes just get to write them down on their sheet. Curiously, the thing that would come to define the barbarian class is entirely missing. The ability for a barbarian to enter a heightened rage state, whereby their abilities are augmented and they become more or less invincible for a few moments, wouldn't come to the character class until 3rd edition. Prior to that, Barbarians were basically big lumps of dumb muscle with an axe, a tribal backstory, and an allergy to magic. So, that's the basic AD&D Barbarian as Gygax presented it. Now, before folks start jumping up and down about how this and that changed over the years and editions, let me just stop you there. None of that really matters to the discussion here. We just want to know where it started and what inspired it. We're well aware that the Barbarian eventually officially appeared in Unearthed Arcana as an official fighter subclass for 2nd edition, 
and that several adjustments were made, such as the Barbarian effectively becoming a magical weapon in and of themselves, if not an actual name. We know, it's okay. It doesn't really matter for our purposes here. So we've answered the first part. Where did it start? Now all we have to ask ourselves is, what inspired it? And again, please cease your leaping about. We know, you know, where we're going to end up on the inspiration side. It's the other half of what you hear in your head when someone says, the barbarian. And that's cool. We're glad you're there with us. But you've only got half the story. No, you've got less than half the story. And since we all know where we're going, we might as well not waste any time getting there. In 1932, writer Robert E. Howard was casting about for a new character to write stories about and sell to the pulp magazines of the day. He'd already had a number of small successes with characters like sailor Steve Costigan, a dim-witted, hard-fisted boxer, and Puritan swashbuckler Solomon Kane, both of whom had ongoing series in print that served to earn Howard a regular income that allowed him to focus on his writing. Solomon Kane, in particular, turned out to be one of the first examples in print of a new genre of story. It focused on tales with elements of horror, fantasy, and mythology, along with a heavy mix of action and swordplay. The use of magic was often a defining feature of the antagonists. It was a genre which Howard would go on to develop along with the other character he came up with at about the same time. You see, Howard had this idea for a hero from the depths of time, a barbarian from an ancient civilization who would travel the prehistory world living by his own might and his own rules. Over the course of Howard's stories, this barbarian would be a pirate, thief, conqueror, and king. And thus, the sword and sorcery genre of pulp fiction was born and developed. And its star would, of course, be the barbarian Cull of Atlantis. What, you were expecting someone else? See, Cull first appeared in 1929, after several efforts by Howard to find a magazine that would take him. While the Solomon Kane stories were printed first, the truth is, Cull had been shipped back and forth to various magazines for quite some time before Weird Tales finally agreed to publish him in August of 1929. Even before Solomon Kane's first appearance almost a year earlier, Cole had been making the rounds. The first Cole story, By This Axe I Rule, just wasn't appealing to publishers in the same way that other Howard works had been. It wasn't until that story had been set aside, and a new Cole story, The Shadow Kingdom, was written, that weird tales went for it. By the end of 1930, three Cole stories had seen print, and a further 11 were in various degrees of completeness by the time of Howard's death. The sword and sorcery genre was well on its way, and the popularity of stories of Solomon Cain and Cole the Conqueror were such that weird tales wanted more of it. Which is why, in 1932, Howard needed a new character. The market was hot, and he wanted to take advantage of it. He had ideas for more stories, but none of his existing characters really fit with what he wanted to write, so it was imperative that he find a character he could use to tell the new stories. On the other hand, he already had a story that had been worked on and polished and refined, but was missing a certain something to sell it to the pulps. If he could make it work with a new character in the new genre, it might save time and effort. He just needed to find the right character to make a few small adjustments. Since By This Axe had been written with one barbarian in mind, another barbarian would do just as well in the rewrite. It told the story of a barbarian king who had taken the throne of a kingdom by force. His subjects were disgruntled and planned a coup because, after all, he was a foreigner and he barely attended to the duties of state. He much preferred to be out where the action is himself instead of kissing documents and signing babies. So a plot is hatched to dethrone him, against which he must defend himself. In the Cole version, there existed a whole romantic subplot which Howard excised and replaced with a different one about a summoned demon for his new barbarian hero to deal with. Finally, he retitled the story The Phoenix on the Sword and sold it, at last, to Weird Tales, who, 
in December of 1932, published the very first story about Conan the Barbarian as we know him today. The son of a blacksmith and born on the battlefield, he learns to fight and soon earns himself, by age 15, a reputation as a powerful and effective warrior. Over the course of his early career, he fights monsters and wizards, meets beautiful princesses, and spends time as a thief, outlaw, mercenary, and pirate, much like his predecessor, Kroll. Over the course of his many published short stories, Howard describes Conan as blue-eyed and black-haired, and rather than being clad only in a loincloth as many picture him today, he dresses in the fashion of wherever it is he happens to be at the time. He's agile and strong, tall and well-built, and smart? Wait a minute here. We thought he was meant to be a barbarian, and everyone knows barbarians are as thick as two short planks. But no, Howard clearly shows that Conan is highly skilled with a sword, has a wide experience of various trades, he's a commander and a tactician, a born leader, speaks numerous languages, and can recognize and decipher ancient scripts and writings. So what gives? Something has clearly gone wrong here. How can Conan be both a barbarian and literate and smart? Well, maybe it's because we don't really understand what is meant by barbarian. Not that it helps explain what Gary meant by barbarian, but then Gary did a lot of things that didn't actually seem to make much sense when it came to describing elements of Dungeons and Dragons, so we'll take a look anyway. You remember back there in the introduction when we said the term barbarian was derogatory, demeaning, and meant to marginalize, dehumanize, and disenfranchise a disfavored segment of society? Well, we meant it. And it's the fault of the ancient Greeks. Barbarian comes from the ancient Greek barbaros, and meant anyone who couldn't speak Greek and didn't follow Greek customs. Essentially, it meant the opposite of citizen. You were either a Greek citizen or you were a barbarian. This meant anyone who wasn't Greek, from the Egyptians to the Persians to the Phoenicians, they were all barbarians. And the story goes that the reason barbaros became the word used to identify non-Greek-speaking peoples was that, to the Greek ear, the speech of non-Greeks all sounded like bar, 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 bar. Essentially random babbling. Just like we use blah, blah, blah to be dismissive of something someone else has to say today. Blah, blah, ends, if you will. But it goes beyond even that. While everyone outside of Greek custom and speech could be called a barbarian, so too could those within Greek society. The term was used to mock and deride the other actually Greek tribes and states as well, especially if they were currently out of favor. It became a catch-all term for anyone who wasn't a self-identified us, and began to bear both social and political connotations. Are you one of us, or are you a barbarian and therefore unworthy of consideration? Do we have to consider how new laws and rules might affect you, or are you just a barbarian and not worth the bother? Eventually, the term even began to refer to people who spoke Greek, but poorly. By the 6th century, the Greek slave trade is picking up. Non-Greek slaves are put to work in silver mines and workshops, and it's becoming possible for people other than the extremely rich Greek upper class to own slaves. Most of the new slaves come from around the Black Sea, areas that are notoriously non-Greek, which means these people are labeled as barbarians. And it's a very short step from there to Aristotle himself saying that all barbarians were slaves by their very nature. He goes on to say, in summary, that because barbarians have no natural leadership tendencies, they are better off as slaves where they can be given direction by their masters and a purpose in life that they lack the intelligence to make their own decisions, and therefore it is entirely natural that the barbarians should serve while the masters lead. Barbarians aren't smart enough to lead themselves, so we're obligated to do it for them. They'll be happier that way. And so will we. The Greeks went to war against the Persians in the 5th century BCE, and here again the usage of barbarians shifted suddenly it becomes the way the Greeks talk about the Persians as a whole. To call someone a barbarian was to call them Persian and vice versa. It becomes a dehumanizing term for the enemy. 
all Persians are barbarians and therefore they deserve to be put down and killed and really we're doing them a favor by saving them from their miserable existence. Nearly as humanitarian an effort as enslaving the poor directionless barbarian from a century before. Keep in mind, this is all helped by a little linguistic happenstance in the Greek language. See, Greek has the word logos, which, among its many meanings and connotations, carries the idea of both speech and reason. In effect, this meant that if you said someone could not speak Greek and could not speak it well, you were also saying they were incapable of reason or reasoning well. Not only were barbarians illiterate, they were stupid. Eventually, along come the Romans, and sure enough, they pick up the word as well. Except now, it is used to refer to anyone who isn't Roman, as well as those who aren't Greek. As if to say, clearly we can't be the them, we're us. Probably Greeks just forgot to mention we were one of them. I mean, us. Throughout the course of Roman history, and especially as it neared its end, nearly everyone who showed up on the Roman doorstep looking to have a word got referred to as barbarian. Germanic tribes which itself is a suspect term since it includes people from widely disparate regions, different languages, and different traditions, Germanic tribes, Gauls, Huns, and other assorted so-called barbarian invasions, many of which were really just natural migrations of semi-nomadic populations, were all called barbarians. And so it went, around the world and through the Renaissance. Anyone who wasn't us was one of them, the barbarians. An illiterate population of barely human idiots who obviously needed to be conquered and subdued so they could receive the benevolence of us and our society. They'll be better for it, really. But that wasn't the way Robert E. Howard wrote Conan, was it? Instead, he'd made Conan a strong, intelligent character. An outsider in many of the societies in which he participated, certainly, but one who worked hard to fit in. He learned the customs, modes of dress, and especially the language of the peoples he found himself among. Certainly, Conan was the flip of the stereotypical Greco-Roman barbarian, as were the stories about him. People were always better off for having Conan around, whether they recognized it or not. Despotic kings were thrown down, evil magicians vanquished, princesses rescued, the poor and downtrodden improved. The argument can be made that the reason Conan was a barbarian wasn't because he was wild and untamed with a low intellect and bloodthirsty demeanor, but because barbarian meant outsider. And only an outsider could see what the problems were with the civilizations he encountered, a theme which reflected the philosophy of Howard himself. But we digress. You can dig into Howard's life on your own if you're interested. Let's get back to Gary Gygax and the Barbarian class for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which, as we recall, you were about to tell us was inspired by Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. Oh, wait. No? Very little of what Gary designed into the Barbarian class seems to actually reflect what Howard did with Conan. In fact, so little of it matches up that we have to say Howard's Conan wasn't the inspiration at all. What Gary came up with hews much more closely to the classical Greek and Roman definition of barbarian. So what's the deal? What was the real inspiration for the class as presented in issue 63? If you happen to have issue 63 of Dragon Magazine, you'll find the barbarian class begins on page 8. However, what begins on page 72 of that same issue is a review of two movies that came out in 1982. And if you want to get to the end of the story before we do, go ahead and read it. Because the guy who saw the movies and wrote the very angry review located on that page is the same guy who gave us the class. In May of 1982, Conan the Barbarian, a film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as Conan himself, was released into U.S. theaters. The film tells the story of Conan, whose parents are killed and village is destroyed by the evil Thulsa Doom, played by James Earl Jones. Conan is made a slave, and then a gladiator, and then becomes a thief, and finally is presented an opportunity to revenge himself on Doom, which he does, eventually. And that very brief, very non-detailed synopsis is even more than Gary would deign to give the film in his review. In fact, 
Gary's problems with the film are manifold. Schwarzenegger's hair is the wrong color, the weapons weren't good enough, that various traps and devices were employed at all in the film instead of a reliance on Conan alone was completely unacceptable, and furthermore, the film was excessively violent and gratuitously sexual to boot. So angry is Gygax that he calls out Dino De Laurentiis as the director of the film for ruining it as he did with the 1976 version of King Kong, except Dino didn't direct the film. He financed the film as an uncredited executive producer, but it was his daughter Raffaella who was one of the film's two producers, and it was John Milius who was its director. That's okay, because Gary then harangues L. Sprague de Camp for daring to be a technical advisor to the film. In short, Gary is very, very upset. He's an offended fan with a point to make. On the other hand, just a week prior, Gary had seen a film called The Sword and the Sorcerer, and I was only mildly displeased with the production. The movie certainly adds no luster to the swords and sorcery genre, but it does not give it a bad name. Silly, possibly, but unsophisticated audiences have come to expect that from heroic fantasy films. Indeed. Still, at least he enjoyed some of it. Sort of. Compared to Conan, it's the better film, according to Gary. It's a similar tale of loss and revenge, except this one features a triple-bladed sword that can independently fire its two extra blades like some sort of missile. It stars, if that can be a word used in relation to this film, a cast of, at the time, relative unknowns. In any case, Gary sums up his review of both films as follows. While I would not see this film a second time, even if given free tickets, it was enough better than the Conan travesty, so that if I had to choose between seeing either of the pair again, the sword would get the nod. Oh, and to top things off, he goes on to not only claim his credentials as a longtime reader of everything Howard put out, but also to explain how the slow and careful approach is to be much preferred when bringing fantasy films to the screen. As an example, he cites the way he is maintaining complete control of the production of the upcoming D&D film, which you will no doubt recall having been released in 1984 or possibly 85. We're told it will have been at least as good as Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark. So we feel pretty confident in saying that the version of the Barbarian Gary presented was less a tribute to Howard's Conan and much, much more of a reaction to the sort of Barbarian Gygax had seen in the theaters. More of a take-that sort of thing, but with a nod towards the classical definition, which, given the classical connotations, is kind of a shame. And besides, once they added the ability to rage in 3rd edition, they really should have just given up on the whole barbarian thing and called it what it really was by then. A berserker. Thanks for listening to GM Word of the Week. The best thing you can ever do for the show is to share it with someone. We really appreciate that. Our patrons are the best people ever. With their support, the show keeps happening. Part of the way we say thanks to them is by providing a short bonus episode each month that only they get to listen to. If you'd like to get in on that too, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com. You'll find information on how to support the show, subscription links, and a whole bunch of other episodes just waiting for you to re-listen to. Or to listen to for the very first time. You can even find a way to contact us there. This episode was written, researched, and produced by me, Brian Casey. Today's music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Conan, what is best in life? I don't know, like a nice tea. That is good. That is good.